We thank Brian Whitaker for that powerful prayer, and we uh, praise God. God hears our prayers, and we're looking forward to a wonderful night as we study together. Praise God. All right, let's turn. Let's turn in our Bibles to First Chronicles, chapter thirteen. We're going to start there, and um, I really enjoyed studying this again um, last night and today. I'd read this about a month ago, but it's oh so good to go over the Bible again and get more insights, get more wisdom. And in times like these, we need a Savior. It is so wonderful that we can, in, in difficult conditions like what our nation is facing and what the nations are facing, that we can turn to the Lord and we can find comfort and peace and strength in the Word of God. I want to give a shout out uh, to Jackie Carter, who's assisting in the chat room, along with Dr. Jean Bratton. I want to give a shout out to all of our friends in different nations who are receiving the recording, our students in in Kenya, our students in, in Cameroon, our students in uh, Jamaica, and in other places. We thank God for you. So let's take a look at this word and, and see what the Lord has for us today. I'm going to be reading uh, quite a bit and uh, sharing what the Lord has given to us. Chapter 13 of First Chronicles, and the word chronicle it means history. It's a history. It's a recording. It's a revisiting. It's a, a, um, a uh, review of what took place. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. David was a wise leader. You want to see a wise leader. You want to see a good leader. I'm, I'm amazed at his organization and his organizational skills. And as you look in for uh, First Chronicles, you see David's organizational skills. We saw part of that last week when we looked at David's mighty men, those mighty men that he had around him. I mean, he had some mighty men around him. Anybody who messed with King David had to deal with uh, Abishai and Benaiah, and those two guys themselves, those were only two of David's mighty men. But Abishai and Benaiah, if David had somebody in his kingdom who was messing up, who was embarrassing the kingdom, embarrassing God, and embarrassing the nation, David sent Benaiah out for them. Benaiah was David's hit man. Anytime Benaiah showed up at your door, you know you were doomed. You were in for trouble. And so David was highly organized, ladies and gentlemen. And as we look at this kingdom and the part that everyone had to play, the priests, the uh, uh, um, those who who were involved with building up and and tearing down and carrying, transporting the tabernacle, and then as they went to the second time around to move the ark of the covenant, and then the Marishites and the Kohathites and and the uh, Levites and their particular jobs. And everyone had a job to do in the kingdom of, 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 of Israel. And uh, everyone worked in the kingdom of Israel. Powerful organizational skills, a powerful leader, and, and his power came from the Lord. So as soon as, as David was um, installed as king of all Israel, one of the first things he wanted to do was to move the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. But then that movement went met with disaster. It was not well planned, and and and, and um, they had not sought the Lord on how to do that. And um, one man, Uzzah, reached out and touched the ark of the covenant, and God put him to death right there on the spot, because no one was allowed to touch the ark of the covenant. So David um, housed the Ark of the Covenant in Arua's threshing, field, threshing floor in a, in, a, in a house on Arua's property. It's very important to note, ladies and gentlemen, that the very spot, the very spot where David temporarily housed the, the, uh, the um, well, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. After 
he moved at the second time. We'll see in this. David is going to move the ark again into Jerusalem. And there he will uh, set the ark up on. Uh, he, he purchased a piece of land from Arua. And that, ladies and gentlemen, becomes the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount where they built the temple and where the next temple will be built on that very same piece of property. Very interesting, his history, and um, we get the real story in, in the Bible. So David, again, uh, they decided to move the temple. They transported the ark, and you see in chapter 13, verse 13, and they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah, and Ahio dra drove, the, the, drove the cart. And David and all Israel pray, played before God with all their might, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalteries, and timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. I mean, they praised the, they praised the Lord as the ark moved. Verse 9 of chapter 13. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Shidon, Uzzah put forth his hand, to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. One of the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before the Lord. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Anytime you see the word Perez in the Bible, it means breach. It means uh, uh, something uh, 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 difficult happened. So uh, David was angry with the Lord because the Lord breached upon Perez. I mean, breached upon Uzzah. Uh, in other words, God killed Uzzah. And David didn't like that. He didn't accept that too well. And, and you may wonder, well, why would God kill Uzzah? But Uzzah violated uh, one of the principles of God's word. No one was to touch the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the priests were to move it with staves or sticks that they uh, pushed through the loops on the ark, on the sides of the ark, and they carried it that way. And David was afraid of God that day, verse 12, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? And David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And so uh, Obed-Edom, the Gittite, housed the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of God re remained in the family of Obed-Edom in the house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. And so for the three months, for the three months that this Another word for a fanfare. Please mute your means phone. Has mute your phone, everybody. And okay. Welcome, C. 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 Williams. Welcome, but mute your phone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We welcome you. Praise God. Star six, everybody, because we're recording. And we welcome Elder Lucia Williams from Birdsboro, Pennsylvania, up around Pottstown, up north of Philadelphia. So... The ark remained there for three months, but while it remained there, Obed-Edom and his household were, household were truly blessed because they had the, the responsibility of guarding and protecting the ark of the covenant. And you need to uh, take a little time out in your studies, ladies and gentlemen, to see the value of the ark of the covenant. The ark was a box, a box, about three and a half feet long. Uh, one and a half feet wide and about one and a half feet deep, and it was a it was a a box that uh, God housed had Moses to house the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and and a pot of manna, and Israel carried that ark with them everywhere they went because it was a reminder of the covenant. It was the ark of the covenant. It was a reminder of the covenant that God had cut with his people. He made a covenant with Israel that he would be their God and they would be his children. And it, was, it's, was, it is an eternal covenant. 
So you need to uh, study the ark and find out what happened to it, where it is now, where, if anybody knows, uh, Indiana Jones did not find the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, they made a movie of it, but Indiana Jones did not find the Ark of the Covenant, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, chapter 14, and Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messages, messengers to David and timber of cedars and with man masons and carpenters to build him a house. David had a good relationship with several kings around him. One was Hiram, the king of Tyre and Sidon. And Hiram sent him lumber, timber that he had cut for David to build the house and later to build the uh, yeah, to David when David collected materials to build the temple of the Lord. Verse 2 of chapter 14, And David perceived that the Lord had confirmed him king over Israel, for his kingdom was lifted up on high because of his people Israel. And then David took more wives at Jerusalem. David uh, had a lot of wives, ladies and gentlemen, but not as many as his son. I mean, his son Solomon went overboard with executive privilege. <laughs> hey, Dr. Gene Bratton. Hey, Jackie Carter. We call it executive privilege. Well, <laughs> praise God. Uh, Pastor LaFrance Johnson, we see David uh, uh, using his executive privilege. Something about a king. You give a guy a throne. Next thing you, you know, you know, he wants a whole lot of wives, a whole lot of concubines. And uh, David, verse 3 of chapter 14, he took more wives at Jerusalem, and David begat more sons and daughters. So he had a lot of wives and a lot of sons and daughters. And it gives you the list of them, um, in, starting in verse 4. Now, when you read the scripture, when you read these names, read every syllable. Don't look at a syllable and do like some preachers I know, get up in the pulpit and can't pronounce words because they did not practice the words. And, 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 and uh, some are too stubborn to ask anybody to pronounce it for them. Hey, preacher, if you can't pronounce a word in the Bible, call somebody and ask them to pronounce it for you. Or be like some pastors, let someone read the scripture for you. And then when you're preaching, just give that person a nickname. Like I remember uh, there are people who could not pronounce Nebuchadnezzar. Some would say Nebuchadnezzar. Some would say Nebuchadnezzar. Some wouldn't say, couldn't say it. And so they nicknamed him Neb. And I did some preachers. Everybody in the Bible had a nickname because the preacher could not pronounce all of the syllables in the name. So don't be going through the Bible. Don't be reading chap verse 5 of chapter 14. And if, if, and I let you, and and no, and and J, no, don't do that. No, don't. Read, pronounce those uh, syllables. Take it one syllable, syllable at a time. And Ibhar, and Elishua, and Alpalet, and Noga, and Nafeg, and Japhia, and Elishama, and Biel Iada, and Eliphalet. Pronounce every syllable, and you can handle these names and words in the Bible. So the next thing we see, after David's declared king, his old enemies, the Philistines, come back at him and try to challenge his, his authority. So war broke out with the Philistines. And uh, verse 13, and the Philistines yet spread, again, spread themselves abroad in the valley. Therefore David inquired again of God, and God said unto th to them, well, the first time they came out, Israel defeated them. Then they... Here they are. They're coming out again. I mean, they took a whooping, but they, they still want to fight, fight with David. And so David always inquired of the Lord before going into battle. And so this next time the Philistine army appeared, verse 14, Then David inquired again of God, and God said unto him, Go not up against after them. Turn away from them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. Ladies and gentlemen, God told David, don't go up against them. Go past them and turn again when you get to the mulberry trees. We see the importance and significance of a grove of mulberry trees in, in, or in Israel. And it, verse 15, God said to 
David, and it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that thou shalt, then thou shalt go out to battle. For God is gone forth before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. So the first time the Philistines came, God, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, yes, go out against them. You'll defeat them. Then the second time the Philistines came on the scene, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, no, 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 don't go directly in, into battle. Don't go out on the field of battle. Go past them. And when you hear the sound of, in the tops of the mulberry trees, then that's when you attack the Philistines. So we see in, in Chronicles how David had such a close relationship with the Lord and how he inquired of the Lord and he asked God. We see this uh, often and, and it's, such, it's such a lesson to us that we should not do anything without inquiring of the Lord. We should seek the Lord. And uh, I was just talking with my friend Roger Pond Jr. the other night, and Roger's uh, back taking courses, and I thank God for Roger. And Roger and I were talking about the first course that we took and offered in the school, and that's how to hear the voice of God. And if there's any one of you who who needs to more more teaching and training on how to hear the Word of God, I want to offer you one of the courses we have as an independent study, How to Hear God's Voice. And um, I thank Roger for bringing that to my attention um, so that we can share with others what Roger and I and many others learned a couple of years ago. How to hear God's voice. How to make the right decisions. How to go with God's uh, blessings, how to get the favor of God on your life. We've got a marvelous course uh, that teaches you how to do that, and we get a prime example from David because he showed us how to hear from God, and then once God spoke, then he would do what God did. And ladies and gentlemen, when God speaks to you, be quick to obey him. Um, if, if, if you're not sure if, if it's the voice of God, you have the responsibility, not your pastor, not your wife, not your husband, not your bishop. It is your responsibility. If, if you think God is calling you to the ministry, it is not your pastor's responsibility to clarify what kind of ministry you're to go into. I've seen many men and women whose lives have been messed up because they let some pastor or some bishop direct them into what a pastor or a bishop wanted them to do. No, I've always been one and I can, will continue to be one to believe that if God has called me to something, God is going to give me the specifics. Can I get an amen out there, Gene Bratton? Can I get an amen out there, Lisa Johnson? Can I get an amen out there, amen. Roger Pond? Amen. When God speaks to you <laughs> and says, this is what I want you to do, then it is your responsibility to know that you know that you know that you know that it is of the Lord. Don't be so quick to run to your pastor and ask your pastor, uh, to develop a, 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 a pastoral plan because most pastors want to, what they're going to do they're going to try to clone you into what they want you to do they want to make a little of them out of you and 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 the bishop's going to do the same thing but me I've always been one like this no pastor is going to show me what God wants me to do unless I first seek the Lord and I trust God and I, I want to lay this on you. This is no disrespect to any pastor or any bishop. But you ha it's your life. It's your calling. It's what God wants you to do. And so it is your responsibility to take the time out and, and do what David did, inquire of the Lord. David had to inquire of the Lord. God, should we go up against the Philistines? Because it means that it's the, what's at stake is tens of thousands of lives are at stake. God, shall, shall, shall we uh, uh, attack this coronavirus this way? Or uh, uh, shall I hire this person? Or shall I fire this person? Or God, shall I do, uh, do what they're doing uh, over in New York? Shall I seek, seek Governor Cuomo's advice? Or, or, or what shall I do? But the first, the first thing, God, and, and that's, that goes for the president, and it goes for you as the head of the household. When, when, when there's a, a challenge coming against you, as a believer, 
And I'm speaking to believers. I'm not talking to the president. I ain't talking to the politicians. I ain't talking to anybody else because I don't know if they're saved or not. But I'm talking to you. If God has saved you, you have the responsibility to nurture and cultivate your relationship with him and ask him. God says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. The reason why many believers get messed up and never fulfill God's calling on their lives is because they uh, do not seek the Lord. They do not fast and pray. They do not spend time in the word of God. But most, most I'm talking about most Christians I know. When, when God speaks to them about doing something, they, they're so quick to run to another pastor or a group of Christians or to get somebody's take on this or somebody else's opinion. And, and, and you know if you have two Christians together, you've got at least three, three, three opinions. Okay? And so seek the Lord while he may be found. Learn from David. Learn from David. Uh, when, when David went up, up against a Goliath, David could not handle that armor that they put on him. No, take this armor off me. I have not proved this. But one thing I have proved, when the bear came against me and when the lion came against me and when I prayed to God, God guided my slingshot and he guided that stone and I killed the bear and I killed the lion. And who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares to defy the army of the living God. And when you take that approach, ladies and gentlemen, sound like I'm preaching now. When you take that approach, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You trust in the Lord, no matter how it looks, no matter how great the adversary appears to be, no matter whether you're outnumbered, you and the Holy Ghost make a majority and no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. I hope somebody got that. I hope somebody got that. I hope somebody got that. Amen. God will pick God will choose the stones from the brook to put in your slingshot. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost guided that stone. When David flung slung that stone against Goliath, the Holy Spirit guided that stone right into the center of his forehead. And God will slay your giants for you if you trust in the Lord. And 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 even if even in a, a thing like look at all that all the noise the Philistines are making out there and they're calling us to go to war and and, and, and our 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 cadre, our lieutenants and captains and generals are ready to go, but God says, No, go past them. Go beyond them. And when you get to the mulberry grove, when you get to the mulberry grove, then when you hear the sound in the tops of the mulberry trees, that's when you attack the Philistines. Ladies and gentlemen, as we trust in the Lord, there's no, uh, nothing that can come against us that, that can defeat us when we trust in the Lord. So learn how to seek the Lord with every decision. Lord, shall I... Uh, uh, Shall I get married now? I'm picking on Brian now. And we, 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 we got a good thing going on. I'm seven months old now. Seven months now. We got a good thing. Lord, shall I? Now, I'm going to stay out of Brian's business. But, Brian, you make sure you talk to the Lord. Uh, somebody said, hey, just a little talk with Jesus. Make it all right. It's all right. It's all right. Just a little talk with Jesus. Hey, Brian, we got some folks on listening tonight. Wish they had, though. Please don't put anything in the chat window because you incriminate yourself. Please don't, don't, don't say anything. But there are people who, if they had just listened, if they had just listened, Brian, to the Lord, if they had just listened, Lord, shall I? Lord, should I? And the Lord was telling uh, some, some people who, who may, they be, it may be in another nation, they may be, may be right here. No, 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 no. Go beyond the mulberry trees. When, when you hear the sound of my voice in the mulberry trees, then that's when you buy that ring and put it on her finger. Okay, we're going to move off from that. We're going to move off from that. We're going to move off from that. Praise God. Gene Bratton, come on and say hello to us. Is Jean Bratton still with us? Hello. Yes, I am. Okay, 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 okay. Was that was that commentary in the word uh, uh, helpful to a lot of people? You think? Yes. 
Yes, I'm having some audio issues. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. I can okay. Hear, okay. I can hear everything. It's just uh, responding. But yes, it's very helpful. When God okay. says move, you move. Okay. And if he doesn't say move, what do you do? You sit until he yeah. says move. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's look at First Chronicles chapter 16. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. Thanks, Dr. Bratton. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made the end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And look what he did when they brought the ark into Jerusalem. And he dealt to every one of Israel both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. David was a smooth operator, ladies and gentlemen. He was a smooth operator. He knew how to win the hearts of the people. David was so excited and so happy to move, to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem that he blessed the people, the people they celebrated, they praised God and, 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 and worshiped the Lord. And then David gave to every man and woman a loaf of bread, a piece of uh, meat, and a flagon of wine that they were to take home. Verse 4, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, we see here in this fourth verse of First Chronicles how God can change your calling. That is why. That is why. And I've seen, I've seen uh, 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 ministers and people called to the ministry and, 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 and trying to do something they were called to do back in 1960, 1970. It wouldn't work back in 1970. And, 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 and still trying to work the same things that they were doing back in 1990, you know, still having those dinners, still selling those chitlin dinners, still selling that pig feet on Saturday, still plucking those chickens on Friday and selling those fried chicken legs on Saturday. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a time when God says, get away from that and let's go forward, let's move on. But I've seen ministries stuck on whatever because they refuse to hear the word of God. But look at the fourth verse of First Chronicles 16. I want to say, share it again. How God can change your mission. God can change your mission. And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord. And to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Now, this, they're at a place where uh, they've never been before. They have never been at this place before. And so God touches David, and David hears the voice of God, and, and David appoints Levites, whose job had previously been to carry the uh, 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 tabernacle, to minister to the tabernacle, to make sure it's properly erected, properly taken down, properly carried, and, and, and everything that dealt with the outer court and the inner court And the Holy of Holies, that was the Levites' job. But now the Levites get more responsibility. And as we walk with the Lord, and as we inquire of him, and in every situation, we ask God, Lord, what shall I do? Lord, how shall I do it? You'll see that God will even change the direction of your ministry. Case in point, when Back to Basics ministry began in 1996, 24 years ago, we began as a ministry, and, and um, God gave us favor with the cable company. It was a cable company then. God gave us uh, equipment, at, and I began making cable 30-minute uh, uh, segments for cable television. A cable company gave us free airtime. So Back to Basics Ministries began to promote the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to publish tracts and publish books. We wrote books, we wrote Black Heroes of the Bible, we wrote other books, and we developed a cable TV ministry. And that was 1996. And as we listened to the Lord uh, throughout that time, uh, this ministry has published, oh, we we, we have our own publishing company, 
of Bethesda Press Incorporated. We bypass any other publisher. We do our own publishing, and we've published about 25 books, 25 books in, in the life of this ministry. Um, and, and not only that, but now God has uh, blessed this ministry to do many other things in his name, including having an international ministry where we're helping to plant churches in other nations and training men and women uh, for the ministry in many nations. So we've come a long way in just 24 years. And so um, I'm saying this not that we're any better than anyone else, but because we have been listening to the Lord. Yes, I've missed God quite often. I've missed him many times. I've missed him. Pride has gotten in the way, and this has gotten in the way, or or uh, somebody's opinion, or, or uh, there are times when um, God would give me something and the board of directors could not see it. And so you've got to be careful who you have on your board of directors. Your board of directors can mess you up. If you've got a stubborn uh, person on your board of directors who does not want to move, who does not want to see growth, you're in trouble. And so um, I've learned over the years, hire them and fire them. <laughs> hey, Amen. What? The, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm a, look. I must tell it like it is. What Donald Trump is doing is not. It's not. It's not a new. He, uh, when I first came into the ministry, anybody who was not willing to be a part of the ministry, I fired them. When, when we first started our first church in Chester, Pennsylvania, God gave me some people to help organize a brand new ministry. And God gave me names of some people. I said, God, I don't want to take people from any church. Uh, God said, I have some people who are not members of any church, and they will follow you. They are following you. And so when I outlined the ministry, this is the very first uh, church, Deliverance Tabernacle, uh, the year uh, 1980. There was one man, he came to a meeting, and he just stood up in my face and mouth up. He said, I don't follow any man. I do what the Lord tells me to do. I understood this principle. I said, yes, I understand that. But in this case, uh, 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 I'm looking for people who are going to follow what God gives me to do because God called me to be the pastor. He did not call you to be the pastor. And he got an attitude, and I fired him. I asked him to leave my house. I put him out of my house. Yes, Dr. Gene Bratton, I did that. Roger yep. Pond Sr., I did that. Yes, I did. And then I told the rest of the people who who – who were on our provisional board of directors. If you're not willing to go where God leads us, then you have the, there's a window up of opportunity now. You can walk out the door because where we're, God's leading us. And I told them, I told them, where God is leading us, he's not letting anybody else around, around this area in that direction. I said, so we're going to do some things that are going to be different, some things that are going to be strange, some things are going to be a uh, 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 totally different from what the rest of the body of Christ is doing here in Chester, Pennsylvania. But you will see the hand of the Lord. And God raised up a ministry that was powerful. We laid hands on the sick in the name of Jesus. They got healed. God cast out demons out of people. We started the first food program, uh, a good, a hot meal, a hot meal every day, five days a week for the hungry and the, and, and the, the, the unemployed. And and we walked in areas where no other church had gone before. Jean Bratton was there with us. She's a witness and many others. Uh, Lisa Johnson, co-pastor Lisa Johnson, was in another town. They witnessed the Lord doing these things. But I had to take a stand. And ladies and gentlemen, a leader has to take a stand. If God has called you to do some work, then your responsibility is to nurture the people following you. But if you've got some who are in it, and not in it, and they're again it, they're going to fight everything you want to say. Hey, why waste your time? Why waste your time contending with bullheaded, stubborn uh, people who don't know the word of God, don't know how to pray, won't pray, but they show up for every meeting to start trouble? No, no. I've hired many, Gene Bratton, and I've fired many. Okay? Amen. Uh, I hired them, and I fired them. And, and and guess what? Did it without a church meeting. Did right. it without a church right. meeting. Why should I call a church meeting to get rid of somebody who's embarrassing the whole community because he's running around town with somebody else's wife? Why should huh. I call a church meeting 
when I know that I know it's my responsibility after I talk to brother so-and-so and he gets arrogant and doesn't want to do it, then the next step, uh, I'll take two brothers with me, and the next step is uh, he's out of there, okay? Mm-hmm. He's out of there. He's out of there. And sometimes some of these things need to be done without involving the whole congregation so you don't ho- pollute the whole congregation with what so-and-so did. And so it pays to walk with the Lord. When God starts moving in the mulberry bushes, that means he wants to do something. And many of you have your mulberry bushes have been shaking and quaking, and you're missing God. Now, I'm not saying fire everybody because you need you can't work a ministry by yourself. You need God. But be like David. Get, get some mighty men around you. Everybody, now everybody around David was not spiritual. Now, come on now. Read your Bible. Everybody around David was not spiritual. But David had some who would protect him. And everybody around uh, David was not quoting scripture. Amen. And David had a problem with somebody on the east side, or David has a problem with somebody down on the south side, uh, and, and, and that person started getting on David's nerves and embarrassing the kingdom and, and causing David nights to sleep. David called Benaiah and said, hey, yep. this is so-and-so. Yeah, so he, why don't you go and talk to him? And if he, won't, well, if he won't conform, then you do what you got to do. That's the way David rolled. He fired mm-hmm. him, he hired him, and he got rid of him. But mostly David stayed before the Lord. And you know what? God blessed David. God blessed David. Uh, and then David did sin. David did sin. And God punished him when he sinned. Okay, so let's take a, just take a, look, a panoramic view of First Chronicles. Chapter 16 is a prayer of thanks. Read that prayer of thanks when David thanks God for who God is and thanks God for bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, and he thanks God for choosing, choosing Jerusalem as the city, the city of the Jebusites, the city where God would dwell with his people. David gave a prayer of thanks, and then... Uh, Chapter 17, God gives David a promise, and David responds to God's promise. And God said, uh, God told David, you want to build me a house, uh, but I'm building a house through you. And this house is not made out of hands. This is a house where your descendants will sit on the throne of the kingdom uh, forever. That's the house God built for David because David was faithful to the Lord. But then God told David, you will not build me a temple because you have killed too many people. You have shed too much blood. But your son will build me a house. And, and David, David did not get angry with God. He didn't take an attitude. If I can't build it, ain't nobody going to build it. No, that's the way it is in the church sometimes. If I can't, if I can't. I'll lead this program. Ain't nobody going to lead. I'm going to mess it up. No, 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 no. What do we see David doing? When God rejected David from building him a house, David uh, sent a message to Hiram, the king of Tyre, and he ordered the timber. He ordered the lumber. He ordered the uh, materials that Solomon would need for uh, building a temple. And, And David got in contact, he sent messengers to other kings, and he gathered in and, 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 and gathered in all of the supplies that Solomon would need to build the house of God, and then David prepared for his own death. Okay, um, chapter 18, we see David's kindness to Ammon. The Ammonites helped David at one time, and so David uh, decided that he would blessed them, and so he sent out uh, messengers to them uh, to build a relationship with them. And chapter 19, we see that they rejected David's, uh, we see they rejected David's uh, overtures. Let's turn to chapter 19 of First Chronicles. And verse 4, wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shave them, and cut off their garments in the midst, hard by their buttocks, and sent them away. And so instead of receiving David's gifts and the 
delegation that David sent to the Ammonites, as David remembered how kind they had been to him in the past, they turned against David. And they took Hanan and others took David's servants and shaved them, cut their beards off, which was a, humilia a humil humiliation for a, a Jewish mm -hmm. man. They shaved them, and then they cut their garments and cut their clothes off uh, just up above their butt so they, they could show their behinds as they walked in humiliation. The Ammonites degraded and humiliated David's servants. And David, well, you know David. Verse 10, now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him before and behind, he chose out all of the choice of Israel and put them in an array against the Syrians. So David had one, he had his mighty men, and he had a general named Joab. Whenever David gave issues, gave uh, orders to Joab, he knew Joab was faithful to carry out um, those orders. So we see in chapter 19 and the, uh, chapter 20, victories in battle, where David solidified his kingdom and, and, and defeated a lot of his enemies around him. Then chapter 21, chapter 21, David did something he should not have done. And ladies and gentlemen, David was a man just like you and me. Um, he, he, he was human, just like you and me. And he made mistakes. And he had to repent of this mistake. I want you to uh, really take a good look at First Chronicles 21. And, and I really, the Lord has shown, shown me some things where we can relate this chapter with this coronavirus. Uh, yeah. I looked at this, I looked at this a couple weeks ago, and then I looked at it last night, looked at it again today, and, and it's, it's, it's a real, it has a real, real close glimpse into why this coronavirus, and it just confirms something I've been preaching for the last four or five uh, or six weeks about the coronavirus. So give me your attention, chapter 21 of First Chronicles. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, and bring the number, number of them to me, that I may know it. You say, well, what's wrong with taking a census? What is wrong with counting the people in your kingdom? God told David not to do it. David was under strict orders from God not to do it. And Joab knew it. Verse 3, And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so much more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Joab challenged David. Why would you do this? God told you not to number the people. Uh, and this was the second census. The first census we see in the book of Numbers, which was ordered by God. But this second census, uh, some people think, well, David was probably had, had designs of expanding his kingdom, enlarging his territory, and he wanted to know how many numbers of, of men he had to fight, to take, uh, take out the uh, kingdoms that surrounded him. I don't know. But he violated God's word. Verse 4, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Joab challenged David, but David uh, prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab tried to talk David out of this. David said, no, go and number the people. So Joab uh, did what his king told him to do. And Joab brought the sum of people to David. Verse 5, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. So Israel, the northern kingdom, had uh, one million one hundred thousand men. And Judah was four hundred uh, and seventy, four hundred and seventy thousand men. Okay, so you have uh, over a million soldiers in the northern kingdom, 
well, the northern kingdom before the kingdom was divided. In the ten tribes of the north, you had 11, uh, 1,100, 1,100,000 men of fighting ability in those ten tribes. And in the south, you had um, 470,000 men uh, to fight. But Levi and Benjamin were not counted among them. Joab did not go and count the Levites and the Benjamites. Um, the Levites were not supposed to go to war anyhow. <clears throat> Verse 7, And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. Look carefully, ladies and gentlemen, at verse 7 of First Chronicles 21. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. God was displeased, and as a result, Israel suffered. You know, I still, and I told Jackie this, and I've said it again and again, I've said it on Sunday mornings in my preaching, and I continue to say it. I don't think America has repented yet. And with this, with this coronavirus, and I know it's worldwide, but one-third of the people dying in this coronavirus are Americans. One-fourth of the total cases of the nearly four million are Americans. And, and, and I really believe, I truly believe with all my heart, I know they're trying to put the blame on China and put the blame here, but ladies and gentlemen, why is this plague hitting America more than any other nation in the world? Why? Okay? And so when you look at what God did with Israel back in David's time, and David disobeyed God. And, 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 and then God gives David three choices. You're going to see these choices in a moment. But my point is, punishment had to come on Israel because the king made the wrong choice. And when kings make the wrong choice, kings have followers who support them in those choices. And my contention is this, and I've been preaching it for, for many weeks now, and God's been giving me the same word over and over again. Second Chronicles 7:14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, heaven I'll forgive the sin, I'll heal their land. I've got people online with me tonight. If I mention a certain person's name, they're going to think I'm 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 I'm, I'm I'm a, I'm a Democrat. They're going to label me as a Democrat, and they're going to uh, 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 tell me I'm this and that. And, and, and no, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm washed in the blood, and I vote the way I want to. But I know when, when my nation has been corrupted, and I'm not uh, 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 stupid enough to, feel, to not recognize when people have been deceived and lied upon. And, and if you're born again, washed in the blood, you ought to come to that same conclusion. You ought to know when a lie is a lie and when, a, when the truth is the truth. And we all need to learn how to inquire of God to see if we're on the right course. But when you see something like this coronavirus growing and, 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 and when the experts are saying the worst has not come yet, sin has to be the cause. Sin has to be the cause. And I like what Stephen Matson says in his book, The Reckoning. Stephen Matson challenges American Christianity because American Christianity thinks it's so holy. We can do anything we want, say anything we want, and, and as, long as, as long as we're uh, uh, aligned up with the right political party, Stephen Matson challenges that whole American attitude. And I want you to read, read carefully First Chronicles chapter 21 because sin, Israel sinned, David sinned, David led them into sin, and the nation did not repent. And so look, 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 when, verse 9, and the Lord spake unto Gad, David's prophet, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. 
God gave David three choices for punishment for numbering the people, for disobeying God. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, choose thee. Verse 12, Either three months famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while, they, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. Gad had heard from the Lord. The Lord told Gad to go to it. David. Say, I'll give you three choices. Three days famine. Or, or, or uh, I'm sorry, three years famine. Or three months to be destroyed by your enemies. Or three days of a plague. And David said unto Gad, verse 13, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of man. David said, I'm in a rough place. But David said, I'm sensible enough to know that only God can have mercy on me. And so let me fall into the hand of God, not into the hand of man. Verse 14, so the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel, listen to this, 70,000 men. I think the total before we came online tonight of deaths in America because of the coronavirus, coronavirus is 80, it was 83,600 and something, probably up to uh, pretty close to 84,000. But David chose the plague, 70,000 people got killed in the plague, in the three days of the plague. Ladies and gentlemen, God does not want to kill. He does not want to destroy, but God is God. He's holy. And, and I, I don't hear many people crying out unto the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, that we have sinned against God. I don't hear it from our, our president. I don't hear it from the leaders. I don't hear it from the church officials. I hear very few people crying out, Lord, forgive us. We have sinned against you. Lord, stop the plague. We have sinned against you. We repent. I don't hear that cry. Perhaps God does, but I, I'm saying from me, I don't hear it. But I've, been, I've been preaching for several weeks now that we as a people need to repent. And we, the church, the church, one of the most stubborn, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most stubborn organizations on the face of the earth is the church. And, and the most, and if we're looking at the superlative, the, the most super stubborn organization on the face of the earth is the American church. You can't tell American Christians too much. Oh, I thank God you all come on. You listen to me, listen to me teach. You listen to me mouth off. But a lot of you are opinionated, and 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 there are certain things you're not going to accept. Certain things you're not going to change. But we need to repent, ladies and gentlemen. We, the the, the blood wash. We need to repent. We need to lead this nation into repentance. If you're waiting on the president to repent, if you're waiting on the Congress to repent. If you're waiting on your neighbor to repent, hell will freeze over because they are more stubborn than we are who are the blood washed. Deliverance begins with us, you and I. We must repent. We must turn from our sins. We must turn from our wicked ways. Then God will hear from heaven, hear forgive our sins, and heal the land. I know that's kind of deep, I know that's kind of tight, but I also believe it's right. And when you look at Scripture, when you look at Scriptures, the many times, do a search, do a search of the plagues that Israel suffered in the history of Israel, and you'll find that every plague came after sin. And when the people repented, then the plague ceased. Even in the book of, of uh, uh, even before there were kings in Israel. Even during the times of the judges, when Israel was defeated, it came after they sinned. But every time they repented, God restored them. Very close relationship, ladies and gentlemen. 
between this coronavirus and 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 our stand before the Lord, our humility before the Lord. And I'm saying this because it grieves my heart because there are worse things to come. As I was telling Jackie the other day, worse things are coming. If we don't get this right, how are we going to be able to take it when worse things hit this nation and the nations? And so I've given my commentary, but I've, I share the word, what the word has said. And um, we talked we talk so, a little bit about many of the things in, in Chronicles. We won't be able to finish it all. But as you look more in Chronicles, you'll see the assignments that uh, people had, uh, temple assignments, the musicians had assignments, the porters had assignments. The porters were the gatekeepers. Those, that's where the mighty men of David, David's mighty men were. They were gatekeepers. They were some bad dudes. Uh, somebody, they had treasurer overseers, people who guarded taxes, made sure people paid their taxes, and they guarded the uh, uh, taxes. Then chapter 27, the king's captains, the tribal rulers, and then chapter 28, Solomon's assignment. Chapter 29, we see gifts from the people, sacrifices of praise, sacrifices and praises, and then David's death. So David recognized it was up to his son Solomon to build a house unto the Lord. As much as David loved the Lord, as much as he wanted to build God a house to live in, God chose Solomon to build that house for him. And David, before he died, he does all he can to make sure that Solomon has everything he needed to build a house unto the Lord. We're looking at a man who loved the Lord. We're looking at a king who loved the Lord. We looked at a, at a king who, who, who uh, was <coughs> easy was, was, was easy to confess his sins uh, when Nathan came to David after the adventure with um, Bathsheba, David repented. And when Gad came to David after David's venture to uh, count another census, David repented. We see a man whom God said, he's after my own heart. He was human. He made mistakes. He erred. He led people in the wrong direction. But he repented. Repentance is so important, ladies and gentlemen, in my life, in your life, and in the life of the king. God honors repentance. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. What a promise. What a promise. What a promise. And God is not a man that he should lie. God can turn this nation around. Boom, in the twinkling of an eye. God can turn this nation. He can halt the plague. He can halt the plague in the nations. I believe God is waiting for people to humble themselves. And, 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 and when we humble ourselves, it starts with us. It begins with us. It begins, don't, you know, don't point the finger at the president. Don't point the finger at uh, 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 the, uh, the Democrats. Don't point the finger at the Senate. Uh, the House rep representatives, don't point the finger at, at these people, but point the finger at you and me. We have sinned against God. We have turned our backs to him. We kick God out of the church. We kick God out of our home. We kick God out of our marriage. We kick God out of the United Nations. We kick God uh, uh, out of the universe. And God Almighty, who is worthy to be praised, is waiting for mankind to humble themselves and call upon the name of Jesus. There's no other way that we can be saved but by Jesus Christ. And so I, I beg you, I plead with you, I beg with you pastors, you bishops, you leaders, I beg with you, each and every one, hear the word of God. Seek the face of God. If you've got decisions to make, 
pray and seek God's face, just like David did. And when you find yourself, like I have on many occasions, out there by yourself, you made a decision, you stubbornly made that decision, now you've got to live with it. Don't be so difficult that you cannot repent. Repent. Fall on your face. Cry out unto the Lord. Lord, I sinned against you. Lord, forgive me. And then God might send you back to the person you hurt. And you ask them to forgive you. God may, may ask you to make amends for what you have done. But let us walk humbly before the Lord. I think if, if there's anything that we get out of the book of Chronicles, the books of Chronicles, is how God looked for humility among his people. How he blessed the people, how he established them as kings, how he prospered them, and yet how he removed them because of their pride. And how when, when people, when people, people follow, you know, follow the leader. That was something we learned when we were little kids. Follow the leader. Whoever was chosen as a leader, wherever the leader went, we went following them. Follow the leader. And if the leader is not right, then the people are not right. And so we all have to spend much time before the Lord. We've been born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and God requires of us. What does he require of you, O oh man? But to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. He said this in Micah, do justly, treat people justly, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. This is Pastor Carter. It's been a real pleasure teaching uh, the Word tonight. I know I got off from the Word a lot, but I think we, we covered, in essence, the contents. But it's up to you. By the way, it's up to you to read these scriptures. Every week we have a list of scriptures, and you should all have your syllabus by now with your assignments. If you're not and you need to get in touch with me, get the reading assignments. I do not... I do not uh, want to see people taking uh, this course for credit without reading your assignment. And also, if you're not taking the course for credit, you have a responsibility to read the Word of God. Don't take anybody's word for the Bible. Read it for yourself. I can't cover all these scriptures in just the one hour, hour and a half, whatever we have. It is up to you to spend time each week reading these scriptures. I'm expecting you to do so. I'm doing this myself, reading these scriptures. And after you read, read you read uh, with, with, with an open heart. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. God's word is alive. He, 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 he wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal himself to you through his word. So get all that you can. Get all that you can. For the time is coming. The time is coming, ladies and gentlemen, where many of us may not have access to the Bible. The time is coming, ladies and gentlemen, where many Christians will not have access to the Bible. I'll leave it there. So you seek the Lord, study, show yourself approved. Pray, pray, pray. Worship God. Praise God. When you get bad news, bad reports, worship God. You belong to God. No weapons formed against you shall prosper. God's going to take care of you. Stop fretting. Stop freaking. Uh, stop uh, panicking. Trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that makes the Lord his trust and respects not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. And do as jo Dr. Bratton always uh, advises you to do. Get some sweet sleep. Get some sl sweet sleep. Sleep. Get some sweet sleep. Some of you need to learn how to get some sweet sleep. In my household, I know somebody's getting some sweet sleep because I can hear them. I mean, I can hear them, man, and they can hear me. <laughs> they know I'm getting sweet sleep. How can Jackie know I'm getting some sweet sleep? Because Jackie can tune in any night and she'll hear. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's, that's, that's the sound of a man who knows his hands are in the Lord's hands. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? 
Okay, that's the sound of a man who uh, knows uh, that uh, Psalm 4, 8 says God gives his servants sleep. Okay, and so, so you get some sweet sleep and um, trust everything to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. We're going to open up this up uh, to questions and answers. I'd love to hear your questions, your answers, and the responses uh, that Jackie and Jean will bring to my attention from the chat window. I'm going to stop the recording. We will send this recording out tomorrow morning uh, to everyone. Um, it's taking more time for our serv ser service provider to process our recording because of the number of online churches. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just praising God for the number of online churches, but you'll get this recording tomorrow. In the meantime, you can give me a call, send me an email, or let's chat with you for a little bit. <laughs>